I met Anna just through like social media, like I think it was on Facebook and saw some of her posts and we became friends on on there. And then I, I, uh, I'm just, I, I watch a lot of YouTube and she came up on my YouTube doing a talk in Telluride, Colorado. That's what we were just talking about is like um, big mushroom festival in the mountains of Colorado in August. And so anyways, uh, she gave such a, an interesting talk that I asked her if she would like to be a guest here. And uh, so she's gonna give us a presentation this month called, uh, I don't know, uh, Fungus Fanatic. So uh, yeah, yeah, I called it uh, uh, Conversation with a Fungus Fanatic. All right, so anyways, thanks for joining us, Anna, and I will hand it over to you. All right, fantastic. Thank you folks for um, having me. I'm going to share my screen. This is exciting. I usually am a lost your voice. Yeah, Anna, we can't hear you at the moment. Yeah, I just realized. Okay, hold on. I have a share screen. And then I've got to go to Chrome tab. That's really peculiar. Um, it keeps muting me. Let me let me try something else. Okay. Um, it's really odd. Like I was just saying, I use Google Meet, and this is a perfect example. I, I, I hear you. All right, am I muted? No, yeah, yeah, there you go. We hear you. All right, fabulous. Okay, so I'm going to just go ahead and do this. Okie doke. So um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Anna McHugh. Um, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, have been interested in hunting mushrooms since December 5th of 2008. I was living in Portland at the time. I have family in Olympia. And so it was just sort of a natural extension of my like lazy and lackadaisical way of uh, walking through the woods uh, in the you know, Cascades in the coastal range of Oregon. So when I moved here in 2013, I was a little, I had a little bit of trepidation that there wouldn't be a lot of mushroom culture around here. And then additionally, I just didn't know what kinds of species I would anticipate. Um, and, you know, almost immediately when I moved into my house, I found this beautiful little creature called uh, Xylaria magnoliae that grows only on magnolia cones. And this one looks like a little hand uh, trying to give me a high five. And so I was like, okay, I think I can make it here in North Carolina. Um, and, you know, as I've explored this area more, it's really become evident to me that we have a tremendous amount of diversity. There's a lot of interesting taxonomy work going on. So I'm always, uh, you know, enjoy sharing sort of my regional understanding. But also, um, you know, I did a radio documentary about mushrooms a number of years ago. And so that was sort of my first opportunity to get to know, uh, you know, people in the mushroom community, sort of, um, you know, understand the background of what I'm trying to learn about. As far as my day to day life, I actually do work in taxonomy, but not in the natural sciences. Uh, I work on um, I work at a tech company. So I do information architecture and organization. So it's a really natural fit for me to get interested in mushrooms. So let me uh, cover really quickly the things I'm gonna talk about. First of all, really fast, um, most of you are probably familiar with this information, where mushrooms live and tips for finding them and how to avoid catastrophes, such as losing your keys in the woods. Um, I also do um, mushroom art. And so, uh, you know, during the winter season, we have uh, roughly from, um, November through May, a really quiet period. And so I suffer from a condition called PMSD, post-mushroom season depression. And to stave that off, I have started drawing mushrooms in my spare time. Uh, then I also talk a little bit about taxonomy and how I grapple with it, because again, you know, I'm a hobbyist and there's only so much I can keep up with. And so I have a certain way of, you know, learning, but, but keeping myself, um, I suppose, not too uptight <laughs> because it's impossible to really, uh, you know, unless you're doing this stuff full time, it's really difficult to uh, get your head around all the changes as they happen. Um, and then finally, I want to cover a number of mushrooms from uh, the southeastern US in case you come and visit us. 
Uh, also, most of these I tried to pair with their sort of West Coast analogs. So you're going to see some species that are relatively familiar to y'all, but are, of course, you know, distinct species uh, that live near us. So why am I here? As in, what qualifies me to talk about mushrooms? As I mentioned, I am a pure hobbyist. I make uh, mushroom identification videos and I do educational programs, but really I'm not even an official science educator. I just have a deep passion for mushrooms in the outdoors. This is a picture of me when I was small and being homeschooled and my education consisted of my mom opening the door and kicking me out and saying, I will see you later. Uh, the creek is that way. So, uh, you know, again, when I discovered mushrooms, it was really um, a natural fit for my personality and the way that I uh, sort of encounter and move through the world. Um, and once I started to get into it, and, and especially in doing the radio documentary uh, that, I, that I did, I got to know the, the really rich culture of mushroom people and the, you know, the humorous characters, lots of people who are, you know, really generous with their knowledge. And the very first mushroom person that I met was actually um, in Olympia. This was a number of years ago. Gosh, I guess, wow, I'm getting old. So it was 2002, so 20 years ago, I was in college and uh, I was living on the East Coast. I was in Virginia and I came out to Olympia to uh, meet with some friends to go to a festival. And I arrived like several hours earlier than the other people that I knew. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna be meeting this person I've never met before. And so, uh, you know, at the airport, this fella named Damien, he's supposed to pick me up. And uh, I asked a friend of mine, like, okay, so Damien's picking me up, that's lovely. What's he look like? And Jason said, well, he's shorter than me. Uh, he's got dreadlocks and he's really into mushrooms. I was like, okay, so Jason is 6'6". So shorter than him, not a lot of information there that's worthwhile. Um, He's got dreadlocks. Again, I'm flying into Seattle in 2002. Again, not a lot of help. I'm like, but the guy's interested in mushrooms. All right, so I don't know exactly what that's gonna look like, but I'm gonna try to hinge my identification of this person on this. So I'm making my way through the Portland airport and I'm, I'm going down the air, oh, excuse me, Seattle airport, going down the escalator. And I see this young man with sure enough dreadlocks, little short guy holding a sign with Amanita muscaria, you know, festooned all over it uh, with uh, my name on the sign. And I'm like, okay, this is the very first mushroom fanatic I'd ever met. Really was um, a fascinating person to kind of get me familiar with uh, with the community. And I have a brief audio clip of a uh, story that Damien told me in the, um, you know, in the process of doing my documentary, because he was sort of the first mushroom person I met and one of the last mushroom people I interviewed in this cycle of creating the documentary. And this is, uh, I, I, let's see if I can get my audio to work. If, if y'all have any difficulties, just holler. Not hearing anything. We're not getting any, not, not able to hear anything. Oh, rats. That's wonderful. All right. Well, we're going to ha have to skip that in that case. Can you still hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Fabulous. Well, that's a pain in the ass. Um, all right. Well, we'll try that some other time. Maybe I'll share. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is um, I'll drop a link to a PDF of the slides. And if y'all want to listen to uh, it, it's a it's a fun little story about hunting boletes and competition in the, the woods of the Northwest, which um, is probably more relatable to y'all than it is even to me. All right. I'm doing the wrong thing here. So I need to slideshow. Here we go. Okay, so here's a picture of me with some mushroom friends. Um, and also, you know, just want to shout out that we very much miss Gary Linkoff. I think this is a great photograph that captures how uh, much of a, you know, a mensch, a fine person he was and how much he brought to the community is, you know, to this day, very meaningful to me. 
But in my own life, you know, making mushroom art is a real passion of mine. I very much enjoy. Uh, so, you know, I've been doing that for about a year and a half and I use sort of blended media and really try to capture some of the spirit of the mushrooms, even though I'm not very skilled. Uh, and so this is an example of one of my projects, uh, Omphalatus Ludens, which is the uh, Eastern jack-o'-lantern mushroom. It actually does glow in the dark, uh, you know, unlike I think it's Omphalatus olearis that y'all have that does not glow. Anyway, I have never seen a glowing Omphalatus Ludens. So I, you know, when I set about uh, starting to make mushroom art, one of the very first things I did was I'm going to do an Omphalatus and I'm going to put glow in the dark paint all over it so that I can actually say that I've seen a glowing one. Um, as far as other art projects I've done, I just want to give you a quick sample of the types of work that I do. So I started off with sort of my, some of my favorite edible mushrooms. So we have uh, black trumpets, craterellus uh, phallax. Uh, we have a, uh, you know, Lady Cora Cincinnatus. Uh, I'll be talking about that a little later. And then um, it's not my favorite edible, but it's really fun to draw as Clytosophy Nuda, just because purple blue things are, are really fun to me. So that was sort of where I started, um, again, was looking at the species I was very familiar with. And as time went on, I started to, uh, you know, expand and try uh, different fruiting body types. So, you know, working with polypores, this is one of my most uh, recent ones is the uh, Exudoporus frostii, uh, also known as the apple bolete or frost's bolete. Uh, I'm trying to popularize the common name, the red wrinkled flabbergaster with mixed results. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a really interesting mushroom that has a bright red uh, sponge with this really wonderful yellow gatation and the, you know, shags all over the stem. I've got an interesting picture of it later, but, you know, it's really been um, a sort of a rewarding way to augment my learning. And it's also helped me a lot with my photographs. And so, you know, when I'm gathering mushrooms and I'm trying to do, uh, you know, a collection for identification, you get your handful of fruiting bodies and you have your baby ones and your old ones and your blown out ones and the ones with the spores. When you're trying to create an art project, the task of making a photograph or taking a photograph that is going to be good to draw is a little bit more difficult because the perspective is, uh, you know, trying to capture both some of the gill or, you know, the fertile surface and the cap. So I spend a lot of time trying to again, get a perspective where I can get a full range of uh, the image of what the mushroom looks like. One of the things that I love about drawing mushrooms is how forgiving they are as subjects. You know, we talk a lot in, um, in the tech world and, you know, media in general about this uh, concept called the uncanny valley. And it's something that is, uh, you know, essentially sets off, um, you know, your internal alarm when you see an image of a, of a person typically that is CGI and there's something not quite right about it. So it's almost human, but there are enough flaws that it falls into this weird, uh, you know, sort of cognitive valley where things are uh, a little bit distorted, a little bit uncertain. Mushrooms are all in the uncanny valley. And so not only that, they're asymmetrical. Most of them are messed up and don't know how to grow anyway. So it's one of those things that is a really, you know, I started drawing symmetrical things like moths and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is much more difficult. So I highly recommend it. You know, it's also a really fun way to get better at your photography um, and get better at uh, finding ways to, you know, like learning the difference between bruising and bleeding and staining. Uh, and that's been a really rewarding experience for me. Uh, one of the things that I do actually in this last slide, it shows uh, is a, a uh, image of Clytosa nuda that is the basis for the image I showed you on a previous slide. I boosted the contrast a lot on it. And, you know, I, I retain the original colors for the actual art, but I like to boost the contrast so that I can see uh, really clearly what, you know, the gills look like. There's a lot of difficulty uh, in creating sort of the, the shadows that you need and the clear, uh, you know, depth of gills without the project becoming too dark. So I oftentimes boost that, uh, you know, contrast way up so that I can uh, do a better job with it. So as far as, you know, if you're interested in trying mushroom art, I highly recommend it. It's very fun. Um, and again, you know, I'm not uh, in any way trained as an artist. And so being able to tackle something that is like, it's not going to be symmetrical and it's not going to be perfect by its very nature. All I need to do is capture these important scientific features. Uh, it, it really makes it a, a fun thing to, to try, especially when, you know, you start to expand into different types of fruiting bodies. 
any recommendations that I have, the one thing that I didn't do in this picture that uh, I almost immediately learned is if you're going to do a, a picture that should, you know, really represent the species, uh, representing the connection between the gills and the stem, if there is, uh, you know, gills and stem, that's really helpful. So, you know, attached versus decurrent versus free is really important for identification in some uh, instances. And so in my early projects, I had a lot of gills that were super attached or decurrent when they shouldn't have been. And that was a really, um, that was like one of the first things I learned that I, I had to do. Uh, another thing is that, you know, when I fuck up, I just continue working on the project. I did that classic, like, it's ruined and threw it out the window a couple of times. And I, I just don't do that anymore. Um, you know, and if it doesn't look the way I want it to look, that's fine. But I don't give up on them until I really have, uh, you know, just completely destroyed the paper, essentially. Um, so besides doing the mushroom art, I also uh, make mushroom identification videos. Uh, I've got just shy of 100 of them. And um, I've been basically doing them since COVID started. So, uh, you know, as a knowledge worker in Raleigh, I was dragging myself to an office building every day. And uh, when COVID hit and we started working from home, I shifted my commute time to uh, walking around in the woods and sitting in mushroom patches time. And, uh, you know, I started to make videos, not necessarily because, um, you know, I mean, I, of course, wanted to share what I know, but one of the ways that I learned things is by reading them and then teaching them. And if I can explain a concept, then I know I understand a concept. And so testing myself in that respect is really uh, a lot of fun. Um, and then I just enjoy sitting around in mushroom patches and finding like the right place to, you know, uh, to shoot a video from. And it's interesting, although I have a good number of videos in my library at this point, during our summer mushroom season, which is very abundant, I have covered probably fewer than three miles of trail in terms of like the entire territory that I have filmed all of these videos. So that just gives you a sense of, you know, how uh, remarkable our diversity and abundance are. So uh, really quickly, back to the basics, y'all are a mycological society, so none of this is going to be earth shattering. We have mushrooms that have, you know, different lifestyles that obviously dictates a lot about how you can find them and where you can find them. So we have our decomposers, we have our parasites, our, you know, mutualistic mycorrhizal mushrooms. And then we also have blended lifestyles. So, you know, around here, we have a lot of oyster mushrooms that start parasitic. And then when the tree dies, they continue to be a decomposer. And then when, uh, you know, microscopic bugs and nematodes are nearby, they can exude a, a, an enzyme that, you know, paralyzes and they become carnivorous and consume, uh, you know, nematodes. So we have cryptic and unusual lifestyles. I wanted to highlight here, uh, you know, one of the things that I, is probably a reasonable analog for y'all's um, uh, lobster mushroom, which we do have out here as well, is uh, Entoloma abortivum. So basically this is a fungus that attacks uh, honey mushrooms. Primarily we have our malaria malia group here. Uh, we also have our malaria oistea, and those are the two primary like ringed honey mushrooms that we have locally. But this Entoloma uh, will actually parasitize it and it becomes a very sort of like, um, you know, a lump of fungus you can see, and it's almost mealy on the inside. It looks like it would be very unpleasant to eat, but once you cook it, it firms up and it becomes, uh, you know, a dead ringer for shrimp. And in the way that so many mushrooms are like, it is a dead ringer for such and such a thing, like chicken of the woods, dead ringer for chicken when it's in the right condition. Similarly, uh, you know, what we call the shrimp mushroom um, is really, you know, it's, it's well named in that respect. Uh, some people call it shrimp of the woods. I am on a variety of common name related crusades, one of which is I think there are way too many mushrooms that are of the woods mushrooms. And so some people call this shrimp of the woods and I'm like, it's the shrimp mushroom. We don't, I mean, I guess we do have Russell as Arampolina, but it's really, really pretty uncommon around here. So I don't think that, you know, and I call that the shrimp rustler. So I've never had confusion around that and not being able, not having to say of the woods just makes me happy. I love brevity. It's probably not obvious, but it is something I actually value. So um, remarks on not dying. This is just a quick overview of where we're at as far as uh, fatalities. So we have fewer than uh, three people per year that die in the US. This is from 1999 to 2016. So it's a pretty uh, large data set. Um, 
uh, from NIH. So it's something like 2.5 persons per year, uh, less than a 10% fatality rate as well with Amanita and Galerina poisoning. And a lot of that I think has to do with better treatments and clinical outcomes uh, you know, with a better understanding and faster diagnosis of mushroom poisoning. And then of course, you know, when you talk about the total number of cases, we have 133 or almost 134,000, always important to note that major harm only happens in you know, half of a percentage uh, a percent of those uh, overall cases. And a lot of mushroom poisonings are simply precautionary visits to the ER, because I know, you know, if I were not a mushroom person and my, uh, you know, kid picked up a handful of stuff from the yard, I would take them to the ER and I would report it as a potential poisoning. So, um, you know, long and short, I use this slide to uh, assuage people's concerns that uh, mushroom hunting is super dangerous, which, uh, you know, I know in the Northwest, the culture is a little more mellow on that. But, uh, you know, besides certain things that are very familiar and sort of like Southern and Appalachian culture, like chanterelle picking, there's a, a lot of people who are highly suspicious of it, uh, which is, is always interesting. So there's a lot of interest, but there's also a lot of intrigue and sometimes a little bit of um, confusion about land use rules. It's, it's a little bit of the wild Southeast. Uh, but as far as, you know, safety tips and, and uh, you know, doing things the right way, uh, always taking pictures from multiple angles for the sake of identification is good. My um, number one thing that I've learned that saves me time is I walk along, you know, a hillside and I look up the hill, not down the hill, because I can see not just mushroom colors, but mushroom shapes. And that really helps. I'm, I'm kind of uh, a little bit on the blind side, but my, uh, you know, sort of pattern recognition for mushrooms is pretty good at this point. Uh, Y'all probably know this too, it's okay to pluck mushrooms, you don't have to like pinch them off at the base and be very dainty about it. Uh, you know, the, the research that I have linked below, this is, well, it's a sort of a summation of research uh, from Fun Fungi Magazine around uh, basically why over the, uh, you know, I think it's a combined 57 years of research uh, demonstrating that, you know, picking versus cutting doesn't really have a significant difference, uh, you know, uh, uh, impact on patch health. Uh, that being said, I always take what I can use or store within three days because I'm lazy and I also really hate that feeling of collecting great mushrooms and then having them spoil in the fridge. And so I tend to be very, very selective in what I take. And, uh, you know, again, it's not a like concern about overpicking. It's much more, I have made that mistake of overpicking a couple of times and I don't want to go back there. Uh, secure your scene, keys, contact info, and critters, making sure that people's dogs are in the right place, making sure that everybody who came in your car is in the car when you leave. These are things that are very important for enjoying a mushroom hunt. And they may seem self-evident, but I have seen keys, contact info, and critters go missing uh, during various forays over the years. And don't get lost, uh, do not get lost. I know that is a really significant concern for y'all in the Northwest in particular, the forests there are very, very dense. Uh, you know, I had an embarrassing and not frightening experience getting lost, but it was really instructive for me. I was um, on the, uh, the North coast of California with some friends uh, sort of North of uh, the Russian river. And there's this beautiful place called Sea Ranch. And, you know, it's right on the Pacific ocean and there's, you know, all kinds of black trumpets. And we had, I had run into this, it was like a golden river of uh, Craterellus tubiformis, which I love that mushroom. And so I was not paying attention to anything whatsoever. Uh, but, you know, at the time, I had some friends with me who, uh, you know, my phone had run down, so I didn't have a timepiece. And I asked my friends, like, does anyone have a spare watch or something I can keep track of when I'm supposed to meet y'all back at the car? And one of my friends said, oh, yeah, I, I have my Garmin, my GPS, you can use that, it's got a clock on it. So I got super excited. I was really in involved with, uh, you know, my mushroom picking. And I realized I had no idea where I was. You know, I could have been half a mile north or half a mile south of where my friends were. And I'm like, no problem. You know, I've got a Garmin in my hands. I know how to use a GPS. Almost immediately, I realized, no, I don't actually know how to use this effectively enough to figure out where I am. And I'm like, okay, well, I do have the Pacific Ocean visible, like it is the largest landmark on earth. And I am hopelessly lost and not getting back to the car in time. 
I ultimately was able to find somebody who is uh, an employee of Sea Ranch and they, they took me back after a lot of questions about like, well, where are you parked? And I had to answer, gosh, I'm not really sure what the name of the place is. So it taught me, uh, you know, not just being careful in the sense of not getting lost, uh, you know, for safety reasons, but just not misplacing your brain because that is occasionally a, a big problem of mine. All right, so as far as uh, taxonomy and the way that I approach it, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what the scenario is with, uh, you know, y'all and your mushroom scene, but our mushroom names are changing all the time. They're like goth kids, you know, one week it's Sebastian and the next week it's Nehel and Armand. You just don't know. And so the way that I approach it is to uh, learn to identify mushrooms to genus. And that gives me a really strong understanding also of genus categories. And, you know, when working with the taxonomies I do at, at work, I realize that, you know, flat and shallow taxonomies are quite usable for people who don't have a lot of knowledge. And I, in a way, almost say, okay, I'm going to approach mushroom identification in a similar fashion so that when I'm in the field, I can recognize the genus. And that gives me a lot of information about how to take the picture, what resources I'm going to use. But, you know, besides my sort of like old faithfuls and the, the familiar mushrooms I see every day, I really focus on, uh, you know, I want, I do get to the species level, but I really focus on retaining uh, these genus level categories. And, uh, you know, I really pursued, this is actually Exudoporus uh, frostii, the one I was, uh, showed you a, an illustration of beautiful mushroom that has, you know, this really uh, like sort of amber yellow gatation on uh, a red sponge and it has this, you know, gorgeous white rim and it, it's just the cat's meow. Uh, but it's a perfect example of why this sort of don't worry, be happy approach to taxonomy is really helpful to me because, you know, I learned something and I just need to remember that like the names are just a container for the knowledge and the names evolve and that is the way it is. I used to get really almost like emotional and upset about name changes. And I've gotten to that place where it's like, yeah, I'm going to have to relearn. Well, I mean, Cortinarius, for instance, I don't know how many new genera we have, but it's like, what, 15, 16 of them. And so being able to relax into it is really important for me. Uh, Exudoporus frostii is the example that I use because uh, on Wikipedia, it was listed as Pseudoporus frostii for a long time, but then it was updated and the name was uh, Buttery Ribolitis frostii. I'm probably, you know, butchering it, but basically it was a genus that was stood up to uh, contain the buttery bolites and it was considered one of them. And uh, most recently, like within the last couple of months, it got moved back to Exudoporus frostii. And so, you know, most of the time when you have name changes, it's like, it's one thing and it's another thing, and then they spin up a new genus. But in some cases, it's just like, it's going to go one way, and then it's going to flip right back, and you just need to, you know, go with the flow. All right, so I've gone through all the sort of goofy background stuff. I'd love to talk to y'all about some of the mushrooms that, uh, you know, are familiar you definitely have uh, some of the same species, but also a lot of, um, as I said, analogs and mushrooms that are, uh, you know, that would appear quite familiar to you. One of the things that I discovered almost immediately is that my uh, basic knowledge was quite transferable, again, at that genus level. But when I started to, you know, call things hiddenum and bilicatum, people are like, whoa, 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 no, you're dealing with different hedgehogs here. You need to back up and, re you know, uh, relearn your stuff a little bit. Uh, but that's it. You know, I have a list of some of our, uh, you know, desirable edibles and some of the ones that I really enjoy finding. Uh, and I do make culinary recommendations, but I want to be sure that you know that, you know, these are highly subjective. I am a very basic cook. Like I'm really into, you know, butter and sea salt and pastas and things that are, you know, like there are some people who are capable of taking some of the mushrooms that I don't find to be terribly desirable. But all that by way of saying, I have a, uh, you know, sort of a classification system for how I look at edibility. I'm not gonna talk about, uh, you know, medicinal qualities of mushrooms because I'm simply not qualified to do so. Um, but before I talk about the specific mushrooms, 
the uh, thing that really is wonderful about the Southeast is we have a tremendous amount of diversity in our deciduous trees. And that gives us a, a lot of different species that associate with those trees. So I wanna talk about some of my favorite mycorrhizal associates. So we have uh, red oak and white oak, a lot of different species of those. And uh, you know, mushrooms that grow with them tend to be indifferent to white versus red. We also have willow oak, which is a really cool looking oak tree. They're very, very tall. And I mean, they, they can be um, really almost like overwhelmingly, uh, you know, middle earth sprawling huge trees, but they have, you know, a narrow, almost willow looking um, leaf, which makes them fascinating. They're one of my favorite oak trees too, because we have um, our uh, Griffola frondosa, our, our maitake that grows here. <laughs> and willow oak is uh, a particularly good associate for that. So you have our oaks, uh, you know, the difference between red and white oak is relatively simple. You have, you know, lobed leaves, but the red oak is, is pointy and has bristles on the end, whereas the white oaks are, are sort of, uh, you know, rounded uh, lobes. So again, there's a lot of different species, but these are the, these are the leaves I'm looking out for. The two others I want to highlight, and of course we have we have tons of pine associated mushrooms here too, but I don't really get too deep into that. It's like a pine is a pine. Uh, but uh, you know, beech trees are highly productive here. They're really uh, you know a beautiful tree. They look kind of elephantine, like they have this smooth gray bark that's very world and you know has all kinds of interesting uh, convolutions in it, and also a very very recognizable uh, simple leaf. And then uh, finally, tulip poplar, which is a wonderful tree. It's just straight as an arrow. Like it, 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 if you wanted to make, uh, you know, a, I guess, um, well, anything that requires a, a, a trunk that is just about as straight as can be, a tulip poplar would be a good choice. Uh, but anyway, it has these really wonderful tulip shaped leaves, which is where it gets its name. And it uh, produces a lot of really good mushrooms. It really uh, favors like low creek bottoms. And so, you know, we see morel mushrooms or a couple different species associate with them. But also I find chanterelles with them. I find a lot of interesting boletes. Uh, but beech is probably my favorite mushroom tree. They're beautiful trees. I love hanging out in beech groves. They're just very chill. Uh, but also you have a lot of really interesting boletes and things going on. But uh, here's a key for the classification system I use for edibility. So we have edible and tasty. These are things that I'm uh, you know, on the lookout for when I'm out mushroom hunting for the table. We also have things that are woody and inedible for one reason or another. Um, and then an, an important distinction that I like to make is you know, edible but not choice and then edible and choice. And so, you know, I, I help administer a, a mushroom forum on Facebook, God help me. And the conversation around edibility is oftentimes confounded by uh, a novice who wants to know if something is edible and someone who is more experienced trying to explain like, yeah, it's edible, but it tastes like shit. And it can sometimes create a, a kind of tension and friction that I'm not terribly fond of. Um, so, you know, in, in my estimation, it's like, look, I try to ensure that people know what is edible and safe, but also like, this is apocalypse food. This is spam, essentially. Um, so, you know, that, that's how I sort of articulate that difference between edible and good and edible and meh. Um, a couple of other classifications for the different uh, types of reactions. You know, it's not just poisonous and unpoisonous. You have mushrooms that, uh, you know, are a little bit troublesome to people, mushrooms that are medium troublesome, and mushrooms that are extremely troublesome from the GI upset perspective, and of course, our deadly mushrooms. Uh, and then, you know, I have flagged uh, the different species by oak and beech associates. Uh, I did mention pine, and there, I'll, I'll try to point out um, the ones that also do associate with pine, but most of the mushrooms I'm going to cover are, uh, you know, hardwood associated. So let's talk about Lady Porus. Um, this is, you know, a, a genus that y'all are probably familiar with. Uh, I guess you, what you have, Lady Porus. Conifera cola is probably one of your most common ones there. What we have is uh, Lady Porus sulfurius. We also have Lady Porus, and the most common one and the most desirable from the edibility perspective is Lady Porus cincinnatus. And uh, that is oftentimes called the white chicken mushroom. So it is different from, uh, you know, the uh, Lady Porus sulfurius and Conifera cola. I'm going to 
butcher it, uh, but it has a white undersurface as opposed to uh, that sort of lemony yellow. Additionally, instead of it being sort of orange on top, uh, especially when it's young, it's more of a like peachy, uh, orangey color. So it's really quite pretty. Definitely, you know, you couldn't mistake it for something other than chicken of the woods if you're familiar with that sort of zoned, uh, you know, flowery array of a giant mushroom. Um, the, uh, you know, as far as, as harvesting them is concerned, as with a lot of y'all's uh, chickens of the woods, the outer zones are the most choice. And so I, you know, when I'm harvesting, I basically shave off like each outer, each zone until I hit a place where it starts to get fibrous and then I stop. Um, with Lady Porus Cincinnatus, I feel like it has maybe about a 25 second period of time when it is absolutely perfect and it's the best chicken of the wood species that I have tried, but very rapidly it gets fibrous and it develops a really unpleasant chemically flavor. It's not quite sulfurous, but it's, it's real gross. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who will like kind of stretch for it. And it's like, okay, it's a little fibrous, but I can still get a flavor of the chicken. And it's like, what you want is a chicken that looks like the one on the right, not the one on the left. So once it starts to look more like a chicken of the woods, that's an orange uh, color as opposed to peachy, um, you're going to find that it's very dry and, uh, you know, and, and it's quite similar in many ways to the mushroom, to the chickens y'all have on your uh, dove furs. Um, as far as identifying them, uh, you know, for edibility, also when the really uh, fresh ones are harvested, they can get quite large, but if you cut the base, it will just soak your hand uh, with this whitish tinged water. It's very dramatic and a lot of fun, especially because, you know, it's sometimes hard to tell just from looking at a chicken of the woods, whether or not it's good, but if you cut it off at the base and it just sort of has this explosion, you're like, okay, cool. I'm taking all 10 pounds of this home with me. Um, another thing that's kind of unusual about this species, they are, uh, a, you know, they're a decomposer like other Lady Porus species, but uh, they decompose uh, root systems primarily. And so you'll find them almost exclusively growing on the ground. I sometimes find them um, on wood, but more often than not, I find them at the, you know, at the base of a tree. Uh, so that kind of makes them distinctive from the other Lady Porus, uh, you know, species around here. And they can fruit in the same place for several years. I've got a few that, you know, get going on year seven with them. So, you know, and they're still going strong. Uh, we do have a couple of edible lookalikes. They're, uh, from my perspective, far less desirable, but uh, Berkeley's polypore, Bondarzoea berkeleyi, and Merepolis somstenia, uh, which is uh, called the black staining polypore. And both of those are extremely common. They have a zonate appearance. They grow on the ground. You know, they, they uh, especially the Berkeley's polypore, it looks like a chicken of the woods that just got washed out and is very, very pale and kind of leathery. And, uh, you know, it, it's um, really the difference can be determined by, uh, you know, its color being darker. And it also has a pretty pungent chemical aroma. So some people like it, I don't. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, like Lady Porus, as it is in many places, is very safe to collect because uh, all the lookalikes are edible and they're also, they don't look that similar. As with Lady Porus in, in many places, uh, you know, it can cause gastrointestinal distress or uh, occasionally, you know, allergic reactions, almost like a bee sting. Um, and I, uh, you know, typically don't see a lot of reports on Lady Porus Cincinnatus, but I do know that that some people are sensitive to it. So, you know, as with all other chickens, it's one of those, like, it's one of the most popular edible mushrooms and it makes a certain number of people sick. Um, so that that is, uh, you know, a brief overview of our Lady Porus situation. Um, also, we have a lot of different hidden mushrooms. So we have at least 17 distinct and, uh, you know, recognized species most of which you can't really tell the difference between them without microscopic study. Uh, but we do have sort of uh, subgenera that help uh, sort of breaking, break it down a little bit. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we have, in, in my estimation, the way I look at them is by, you know, color and seasonality. So our, our season for hedgehog mushrooms, it starts out in June, right around the time our sort of proper mushroom season begins. 
and they last, you know, one species or another will last you all the way through December. So uh, in these photographs, you can see uh, sort of the difference between, um, you know, a, a wintertime hedgehog mushroom. They tend to be far more tawny in color. They, uh, many of them stain, but it's almost like a darker brown staining, whereas the summertime ones are oftentimes very white or, uh, you know, sort of a, a pale, um, like vanilla ice cream color with uh, very frequently a lot of uh, orange staining reactions. But, uh, you know, the winter hidden in my love because it's right next to uh, an Exidia mushroom, which is, you know, basically the only thing that you can find in December and January with any degree of reliability. Uh, so we, um, you know, have a lot of, of different species. Uh, Hiddenum vagabondum is my favorite name. I really wish I could, I could identify it without a microscope because the vagabond hedgehog just, it just delights me. And I wish I could say, like, I'm, I'm pretty confident that this winter Hiddenum, there's a, there's a one in four chance that that's what it is. Uh, but I'm not going to say that with confidence because, well, one in four isn't good enough. Um, as far as finding them, as with how y'all experience it, um, they live in chanterelle patches. They associate with beech and oak. Uh, but, you know, chanterelle patches in, um, you know, this part of the world, they tend to be in the, like, second growth, uh, not really old oak forests, not that we have very many, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, oak groves are, you could just find an astonishing number of chanterelles. And uh, that's always a good place to look out for hidden them as well. Uh, and, you know, especially if you're in a chanterelle patch and you see a couple beech trees, that is oftentimes where the hidden them hide. Uh, I mentioned the orange staining. Sometimes it's really dramatic. And, and uh, most of the mushrooms that we have are in, um, or most of the mushrooms that stain orange are in subgenus alba. So white hedgehog mushrooms. Um, so the, you know, the two that are on the uh, right hand side, I would uh, put in subgenus alba. Um, one other note, you know, if you're out here, this is uh, one of my most disappointing discoveries because I love hedgehog mushrooms. I'm just a huge fan of them. Um, but our hedgehog mushrooms, unlike y'all's hedgehog mushrooms, get bugs. And so anytime you harvest them, I was so used to like, you know, the, the coast of Oregon and I just pick them up and not even look at them because I knew that they were pretty bug resistant. The first time I found hedgehogs here, I was super excited and I picked them and almost immediately I'm like, oh, we have maggots going from the ground up, but it's almost exactly like a bow weed on the inside. And so that is something that um, not just with hidden them, but with all kinds of mushrooms, uh, you know, the uh, slice it apart and make sure it's not bug infested is an important step for us. And that a lot, I think, has to do with our season because, you know, it, it's in the summertime, it's very hot, it's very muggy bugs are going bananas. It's a, you know, it's a very active time of year in the woods of North Carolina. Uh, we also have a lot of cantharellus. I don't even know what the species count is. Some of the literature is a little cryptic to me. I just don't know if I can dig deep enough to really fully understand it. But essentially we have, you know, a lot of different species, probably well in excess of that 17 that we have for the hiddenums. But I can't commit to a number. Our season starts out right at the beginning of June, lasts till typically the end of October, contingent upon weather. And we have basically a cascade of numerous different cantharella species that will fruit throughout the summertime. So we start out with some really beautiful golden chanterelles right around early July. We start to see my favorite, which is on the, uh, the right here, which is cantharellus velutinus also known as the ghost chanterelle, which is a sort of, you know, peachy colored uh, chanterelle, but not the same as the peach chanterelle, Cantharellus persicanus, which is a much smaller species. Um, but, you know, it, it has a very, oftentimes a very Georgia O'Keeffe look to it. Uh, really a big fan also because it is um, very firm and less likely to be bug infested. So you can oftentimes get uh, chanterelles that are larger in size. So that's a larger end of our spectrum. And then we have really itty bitty cantharellus. So we have cantharellus cinnabarinus. And these guys are probably, you know, the diameter of a 50 cent piece at the absolute most, usually around the size of a quarter. They're really beautiful. They also grow in very large patches, so you can collect a whole bunch of them. They don't have a lot of flavor, but they're very, very colorful and just sort of fun to put on. I put them on pizza oftentimes because they make a pizza look very festive. Um, 
We also have some craterellus mushrooms that are similarly small that I really uh, fancy. So we do have some craterellus tubiformis that I mentioned I really, really like. It's just one of the mushrooms that I enjoy eating and it's just delightful. Uh, we also have a craterellus that looks very, very similar to uh, cantho. So we have cantharellus minor, which is a little chanterelle. And then we also have craterellus ignicolor, which is almost identical in appearance, except craterellus ignicolor is more uh, flame colored and it grows oftentimes on wood. So we have these like little cantharellus to craterellus species. And the, 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 a lot of them have migrated between those two genera over time. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, to me, always, I, I love finding craterellus of any variety. I didn't have time to put, uh, put many pictures in here, but nonetheless, it's one of my favorites. All right, let's talk about the, if y'all have any relatives in the South and they're not into mushrooms, this is the one mushroom you will hear about, uh, Desarmillaria cespitosa, also known as the ringless honey mushroom. Most recently, it was called Armillaria tibescens much to the chagrin and, and emotional reaction of some people, it was renamed Desarmillaria cespitosa. My understanding is that um, as far as the justification for spinning off the new gen genus is primarily morphological, so the lack of uh, a ring, which, you know, given that in our malaria, you have genetic and um, a lot of mating studies that you know indicate that that basically this mushroom probably belongs in our malaria and not this desar malaria thing. So I think desar our malaria cespitosa is probably going to go away sometime soon, just because I know that it brings people a lot of cringe and pain because I don't feel like it was some you know uh, like that that it was too much of a morphological decision to spin it off essentially. But you will hear about this from people, um, you know, who are non-mushroomers because it's very common, uh, like incredibly parasitic on people's trees and plants. And this species goes off like a bomb all at the same time, usually in the first couple of weeks of September. And it's weather dependent, but it's like one day all the ringless honey mushrooms wake up and they're like, we're going to just explode today. And they grow very, very rapidly. So, you know, this... Uh, this is actually uh, from my yard, and this is, the, they emerged in the morning, and by afternoon, you know, they're much larger. <laughs> uh, so, that, you know, they're, they're very rapidly growing. They grow in, um, you know, uh, clusters in the same way other honey mushrooms do. You can see they have absolutely no honey color to them whatsoever, but, you know, that, so what? Um, they are, as I mentioned, highly parasitic, and, uh, like, they're, they're killing my trees, and it just makes me so upset. But there's not a lot that you can do about it. So it's a, you know, it's a really rampant problem around here. They are edible with caution. I'm not a big fan, um, especially, and I say this a lot. It's like, yeah, you could eat it, but I, um, you know, there's so much abundance. There's a lot of mushrooms that I may even eat and at some point would become very fond of, but because there's so much stuff that I really like uh, that, you know, I, I kind of lose the amount of time that I would need to try everything. But in the grand scheme of things, when I have tried this mushroom, it does not meet my basic like good to bad standard, which is, I call this the hot pocket rule. Is it more or less satisfying than a hot pocket? And if the answer is it's less satisfying than a hot pocket, there's absolutely no reason that I ought to eat it. I put Desarmillaria cespitosa in that uh, category. Um, it does oftentimes, and these, these specimens don't show it, uh, as it matures, it will often, but not always, have gills that, uh, you know, start to become the current. It has a very, uh, you know, a lot of white spore deposit, and then uh, fibrous stems and little uh, sort of fibrous blackish hairs on the tops of the caps. But again, you know, I mean, this is the mushroom that, like, when I see them in my yard, I start counting the text messages from people, usually people I haven't heard from since college. And they're like, hey, you're my mushroom contact. What the hell is this? And it's very nice to be able to say, you know, that I'm confident that, that I know what it is and that people can eat it. And oftentimes it's a big concern for people with their uh, pets and animals because they really stink very badly. But uh, um, at, as Good luck would have it. It is not toxic to dogs, which is more often than not when we have people who are concerned about poisoning events on social media, it's about their pets as opposed to, you know, um, human consumption. 
All right, so I want to talk about uh, Ariobolitis betula. This is one of my favorite edible mushrooms. It's also just a really beautiful mushroom to find. It is extraordinarily common. So, you know, when it is um, shaggy stalk foliage season, they're just everywhere. And, uh, you know, they're really distinctive because they have an incredibly tall stem relative to your average bolete and you're used to having you know sort of a fat stem and a fat cap instead they have a tall slender stem and um you know oftentimes the cap is not very large by way of comparison with another bolete so like the the center picture is probably about as uh, large uh, as this mushroom gets, and it would probably be about, you know, six to seven inches tall, which makes that cap, you know, no more than, uh, um, you know, the size of a jelly jar opening, essentially. Um, but most of the time you'll find them and they have much, much smaller caps and they're sort of a, you know, cherry reddish color, a little bit on the, the you know, shiny side. And they have these really distinctive shags on the stem. Um, you know, it's just this massive overlay of uh, shaggy yellow material over a red stem. They have a lovely sort of citrusy flavor. Uh, so I'm, a, you know, really enjoy eating them. And, uh, you know, an another thing that's a really distinctive feature is that they have a massive hunk of uh, white mycelium at the base. So it's very difficult to even harvest this mushroom without pulling out, you know, this huge hunk of mycelium that's also radically different in color. You know, it, it turns snowy white and it's very floofy. You can see uh, a little bit of it emerging from the, the side of um, the tree there on the left hand side. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of the, our other Bolitaceae. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to really rock and roll. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, guild boletes in the Phyloporus genus. Uh, this is from my yard, Phyloporus rhodoxanthus. It's absolutely everywhere. So it is a, you know, Bolitaceae mushroom that, of course, has gills because mushrooms insist on being confusing. From the top, it looks exactly like a two-colored bolete of some kind. Uh, like I have them growing side by side in my yard and oftentimes I have to flip them over before um, you know I can determine which they are. Phyloporus is also interesting because it gets a lot of hypomyces infections. So it behaves like a bolete except for uh, this gilled surface. Uh, we have Reddy boletus, uh, that is a, you know, a genus that has mushrooms that are characterized by a lot of reticulation. Uh, so Reddy boletus ornatipes is my favorite and the most common of them, really, uh, you know, dominant in beech groves. And it has reticulation, it's just gorgeous, almost all the way down the stem. So it's very dramatic. Um, and then we also have a genus that I really enjoy, uh, Tylopolis. Many of them are inedible because they're very bitter. Uh, but, you know, you have purple ones typically. So you have Tylopolis, Plumio violaceus, uh, Tylopolis phellius. There's a number of species. And again, most of them are like, they're edible unless they're very, very deeply bitter. And then we also have Tylopolis uh, balui, which I love because it's like all the Tylopolis mushrooms are, you know, sort of this violet color and they turn a little gray and they can be a little drab. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, it's like, we're going to hop to the other side of the color wheel and we're going to be a bright yellow uh, Tylopolis that has this really pristine white uh, spongy layer underneath. Uh, so that's just a quick sample of some of our Bolitaceae. It's in many places. It's really complicated. There's lots of species um, and I'm not an expert in them. Another uh, wonderful edible, uh, uh, well, a couple of species is Russula parvovirescens and Russula crustosa group. These are known as the blue-green quilted or cracked cap Russulas. They're really uh, quite delicious compared to other Russulas that are very bland or super spicy. Uh, they're very distinctive because they have this sort of greenish uh, cracked appearance on the top. Uh, the crustosa group is not so much green, often more gray, and then sometimes pink, because why not? Um, I really love this particular, like I don't find Russula parvovirescens in the strict sense very frequently. This is the blue-green one that's on the left-hand side, but I love the, the fact that I found a parkour slug on Russula parvovirescens, which is one of the very few times I've found it, and I've just enjoyed uh, the fact that I had a slug climbing all over it in uh, ways that looked very dangerous. And of course, I had to draw a picture of this one multiple times because doing the quilting was very difficult for me. 
All right, so um, almost out of time, but definitely this is one that you probably recognize, uh, Lactarius indigo group. We have a minimum of four species. The ones that grow around here are, from an edibility perspective, really mediocre. Uh, they tend to be mealy. They don't have a lot of flavor. They're beautiful, and a lot of people, you know, myself included, use them in a culinary sense, but oftentimes more aesthetically than anything else. Uh, but I really enjoy, I think my favorite part about Lactarius indigo is, I mean, of course, it bleeds massive amounts of blue juice. It's very dramatic and over the top and goofy. And, it, you know, when you cut one, it looks like you've been in a knife fight with a Smurf or something. But uh, the thing that I, I've become obsessed with about this mushroom is these little pits on the stem. So you, you can see it very clearly on the one on the right and also uh, the picture that I made. You have these, these little, you know, darker bluish pits on uh, on the stem. And it's really cool to look at them under the hand lens because they're very gooey on the inside. So it's, a, it's a, just a feature that I don't know why, it just tickles my fancy. Um, and you know, and you can see they just start to develop sort of greenish colors. So uh, similar to a lot of other, uh, you know, Russellas and, and uh, Lactarius mushrooms that take on sort of greenish colors as they age. Um, these, uh, this two speed, pair of species, Lactarius paradoxus and Lactarius chelidonium are sometimes mistaken for Lactarius indigo uh, because they are sort of bluish in color, but they're more blue purple. Lactarius chelidonium is the one um, on the, actually on the left, you have both species side by side. So on the extreme left, you have Lactarius paradoxus. That tends to be more in the blue range on the uh, right hand side, this like blue purple thing, that is the most beautiful Lactarius paradoxus I've ever found. And then um, you have Lactarius chelidonium, looks very similar, except it's uh, got orangey tones. And both of them have sort of a cranberry colored, but very scant uh, milk. As far as edibility is concerned, one of our most popular ones is Lactifluus volimus, also known as the fish milky cap uh, volimus for its voluminous latex. So when you damage the gills, you just get this explosion of very, very sticky, very latex uh, smelling um, latex. And I mean, it's really gross. It smells, uh, it's been described as a lot of different things, but it's very, very condom-like, like it's super gross, but it cooks off really abruptly and it's a wonderful edible mushroom. And, uh, you know, I love the sort of terracotta color of it because uh, it has the darker, you know, um, cap and then this lighter colored stem. They're really something special. And of course we have a lot of uh, different, you know, Amanitas to be aware of, just a mess of them. But as far as the poisonous Amanitas, we do have some Amanita phylloides, but most of our poisonous mushrooms are one kind of destroying angel or another. The most common of which is Amanita bisporigera. So uh, different from y'all's destroying angel, Amanita ocreata, if that's what y'all are still calling it. Uh, but, you know, very, very similar mushroom from a morphological and appearance perspective. But uh, we also have other less common destroying angels. This is another photo from my yard, Amanita C.F. Volvata. So it's a destroying angel that has no ring. Uh, but you know, we have, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of five or six different species. And uh, you know, the one, again, that I see the most frequently is uh, Amanita bisporigera. And it's certainly the largest of those. Um, but yeah, we do see phylloides, but not very frequently. All right, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes, I apologize for running over, um, but a couple of minutes on Amanita section caesariae. So the Caesar's mushrooms, very popular edibles, and also one of the most distinctive mushrooms from this part of the world, like southeastern United States, Amanita jacksonii and its relatives in Amanita section caesariae are just everywhere. And they're so distinctive, they're really, um, you know, a treat uh, for our midsummer season. So they're like a July, August mushroom. So Amanita jacksonii in the strict sense is characterized by the mushrooms that you see here. So you have a lot of striation, you have coloration that is, um, you know, red to yellow. The thing that may, oh, and yellow gills, which for an Amanita is kind of unusual. You have a big, uh, you know, uh, vulvate cup at the base and um, then a, a nice, uh, you know, large sort of orangey ring. But the thing that that makes Amanita in uh, Amanita jacksonii in the strict sense distinguishable from all of its other sort of uh, you know edible but different relatives is this reddish yellowish chevron uh, appearance on the stem. So you'll see a white stem that it has this uh, sort of remnants of uh, reddish, it almost looks like stretch marks or chevrons in some cases. So this is Amanita jacksonii in the strict sense. 
We have a lot of other ones, uh, Amanita AR-01, which stands for Arkansas, not assault rifle, rifle or arma light. Uh, it looks almost identical to Amanita jacksonii, except it has a really distinctive sort of like cracking uh, that happens around the perimeter of the, uh, the cap. That's a very distinctive thing that that mushroom does. And it also doesn't have that, that reddish streaking. And then we have an Amanita that looks you know, and I would call this Amanita section cesarea, Sterps hemibafa, which is a big mouthful for saying it looks like Amanita jacksonii, but it's not. And, uh, you know, this this is a good example. It looks, uh, it's a dead ringer, except it doesn't have uh, that reddish coloration. All of these are edible. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that novices occasionally can get very panicky when they're like, I found Amanita jacksonii, and that's known to be a good edible. And then someone comes back and says, well, technically that's AR01. And then you have a little bit of fear going on. So, you know, we try to say Amanita section cesarea is safe. And then we have a lot of uh, taxonomy complexity. Uh, so we have some yellow ones as well, Amanita arkansana and Beningiana. Uh, really big fan of them. They're, they're just beautiful sort of big bird colored uh, mushrooms. And I have difficulty telling the two species apart. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I, I really enjoy finding them. They have also smaller uh, cups at the base, typically these two species. So they're of the different Caesar mushrooms, probably the most distinctive. All right, uh, Chlorophyllum molybdides, molybdides, Jesus. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure y'all have this mushroom in great abundance. This is probably one of our most common terrestrial mushrooms that you'll find everywhere. Uh, this is an image of my dog, Ellie, giving me the stink eye because she hates mushroom season uh, because that means less time for fetch and a lot more time not moving and taking photographs. Uh, but, you know, this is a poisonous mushroom, it causes a lot of very bad GI upset, uh, and, you know, we sometimes get in a little trouble because our uh, chlorophyllum occasionally stain a little reddish, which people will occasionally look at descriptions of macro lepidiata and like, you know, um, tasty parasol mushrooms that will mention uh, saffron staining or reddish staining. And so sometimes people will consume these mushrooms thinking that they are, uh, you know, based on that feature alone, which is really unfortunate because they're kind of doing their homework, just not quite all the way. And it's, um, you know, it could be it's really disappointing for people, um, to say the least. All right, we also have a Mesoganoderma species. So we have golden reishi, Ganoderma sessile. So it's a, a wavy looking reishi, hemlock reishi, and also we have artis conch. Um, and uh, Ganoderma curtisi, the golden reishi, is ubiquitous. Like if you're near an oak tree, there is a fair to middle in chance you're going to find Ganoderma curtisi almost all year as well because the fruiting bodies, they're woody and they last for quite a long time. Uh, but they're very beautiful because they have the sort of golden color. A lot of them look, you know, when they're young, sort of like the Starship Enterprise. Big fan. All right, just wanna cover a couple of mushrooms that I just love and I think they're interesting. We have Astraea species. So this is a little itty bitty earth star that opens and shuts when it's uh, moist. And so they've got these cute little like cracked tentacles. They look like they're crawling across the ground. And again, they're like about that big, really adorable. And also one of the few mushrooms you can find sort of in the dead of winter. And so during a normal, like in July, I would probably not spend a lot of time looking at and photographing Astraea species. But you know, when there's not a lot going on, it's kind of cool to have a chance to focus on these uh, smaller, more humble things. Uh, so big, big fan of that. Uh, also, Coltricia cinnamomea. Uh, I'm trying to popularize the name uh, Jason Momoa's Cinnamon Coltricia. We'll see if that catches on. It's a very unusual fungus. It kind of feels velvety and soft on the top, like a turkey tail. And it's got this, uh, you know, it, almost amber reddish color. It's very pretty. And then these really unusual, colorful yellowish pores underneath, but it is stiff and, uh, you know, furry in the same way that a turkey tail is. So it's one of the more unusual fruiting bodies that we find. Um, and I, I uh, don't find it frequently, so I'm always delighted when I do. Um, and then finally, Neophavalus genus, uh, also known as the honeycomb polypore. So we have this beautiful sort of hexagonal undersurface. These are similarly a, you know, wintertime mushroom. Well, you can find them a lot of the year, but they, they are very abundant in the wintertime. They love long walks on the beach sticks. 
and uh, you know they are uh, inedible just because they're very very um, you know fibrous. But um, in particular, they're kind of thin, and so if you find them early in the morning and they're backlit by the sun, you just get this radiant like honeycomb appearance is worth spending time with your hand lens we have a few different species of it but it's one of my you know from an aesthetics perspective one of my favorites so that's really all i've got time for in fact i have overspent my time by uh, a couple of minutes i really appreciate y'all uh you know showing up definitely welcome any questions and i'm going to stop sharing my screen one other thing i'm going to do is um I'm still sharing my screen. I need to figure out how to how to think talk at the same time. All right. So that's um, a link to the the PDF if you want to download it and check and see if my references are correct and you know all that stuff. Cool. So thank you ever so much for your time. And um, if you if you all have questions or want to get in touch, I'm always delighted to to network with uh, you fine folks on the West Coast.